Ok, é. Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's seminar. I am Gabriela Alström. I'm a journalist and writer, and I have the great pleasure of being the moderator of today's webinar, which will be in English. But if you need a Swedish translation, um, there is the possibility to get that, and I will explain just this in Swedish. Så, ni som vill ha en svensk översättning, ni hittar en symbol eh, längst ner i menyraden. Det står interpretation, det ser ut som en liten jordglob. Och om ni klickar på den så aktiveras en ljudkanal för översättning till svenska. Och ni ser där att ni ska välja mellan svenska och engelska, så då väljer ni svenska. Okay, so the topic for today's webinar is international guidelines concerning HIV and breastfeeding. Why do international guidelines and recommendations from organizations such as European AIDS Clinical Society and World Health Organization look the way they do? And how are the guidelines implemented in different European countries? Previously, for example, in a seminar organized two years ago by Positiva Gruppen, we have focused more on the Swedish setting. And today we will go further into the history and context in which the international guidelines concerning HIV and breastfeeding have developed throughout the years. And we will also learn more about what is happening on the ground right now in different European countries. And we are very happy to be joined by two prominent guests and experts in this field. Yvonne Gillesi from Great Britain and Annette Hubbard from Germany. And after their lectures, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. So please, if you have those, uh, you can use the Q&A function or the chat function in Zoom. And you can also, if you prefer that, uh, text a message to 070-040-757-81. I think we will see the number in the chat as well. And uh, you can write the questions in uh, Swedish if you like to, and um, we will translate them from here. So, but now I would like to uh, give a warm welcome to our first lecturer today, Yvonne Gillesi, Honorary Clinical Professor of HIV Medicine and Sexual Health at Brighton and Sussex, Sussex Medical School and University Hospitals in the UK. Since January this year, she's the chair of the British HIV Association, and she is also chair of WAVE, Women Against Viruses in Europe, which is a group within European AIDS Clinical Society. And Yvonne is joining us today from the UK. Please, Yvonne, the floor is yours. Great, thanks very much for that lovely introduction. Can I just check, do you have my slides to be able to share the screen? Is that possible? Uh, yes, I think so. That would um, be great. Yes. I will just check here if we I'm just having that. difficulty getting sharing my yeah. screen. Do we see that? Do we have the Is it possible for you to share it because we don't have them here? We can't You don't have them there. there. Okay, let me just Sorry, my um, laptop is not behaving this morning at all. My ward round is running late, so apologies mm. to keep you all waiting. Um, so while I'm looking to start my slides, I guess I, I'm really grateful to be speaking here today and also with Annette Habrell from WAVE as well. Um, I did a talk in Sweden at the Nordic HIV conference uh, on the 29th of September, and it was on HIV and aging. But having known this was coming up, I did make sure that I gave um, people uh, a kind of a, a heads up about the meeting and why we were doing it. Um, so I think it's really, really, it's really great that actually we're able to speak in a, in a forum and, and also 
advise HIV physicians who maybe are not uh, particularly uh, women interested in the, the Nordic HIV conference as well to be able to talk there too. Um, we know that breastfeeding and HIV is really, really difficult. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult topic because it's very emotional uh, for women and for birthing parents, but also I think for clinicians as well, I think changing from where we always said we wouldn't do something to where we will do something, um, I think really has made a big difference. Um, and I think that this is what we're trying to do is, is move from what we used to do, a bit like before we used to say to people, don't have sex uh, until we got the U equals U data. Um, you know, it's it's changing from that mindset to actually this is safe, this is okay, this is not a problem. Um, I'm just I can't find it on this laptop. I'm really sorry. You sure you don't you don't have it, Anna? No, definitely. Ron, I think we have the possibility oh, to share it from here. That's great. I'm just finding yeah. it on my phone and then I will send it to myself again. Yeah. Because Annette has it too. Yeah. Apologies for this. There's, there's some noise. I don't know if if yes. Here, there somebody is. Yeah, there is. An, there, I can hear it too. There's a noise. I think it's there. a colleague of mine is on the phone. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 So, um, I've just sent that to myself again now. Now we have, we share the screening. Oh, you have it there. Okay, brilliant. Perfect. So if we just put it onto slideshow, it'd be great. Hmm. So I think thinking about the complexity of, of infant feeding and HIV, I think just even starting with the language, where we've always talked about breastfeeding, we now need to be inclusive. Um, women are still the main um, uh, people who are having pregnancies, but also we are having transgender people uh, having pregnancies as well. So I think it's important that we move from just women to women and birthing parents and from breastfeeding to breast and chest feeding. So for the purposes of this talk, I speak about infant feeding, breast and chest feeding, but where data is women specific, I will talk only about women. Next slide, please. So going back to the next slide, my disclosures. So going back to the complexity of what's been happening with HIV. So I'm going to talk about ART, but actually thinking about bonding, breast is best, disclosure, cultural intersection, risk is not zero. There's so much to consider. Um, in what is often a very short appointment, uh, given the complexity of what needs to be discussed with every woman. Okay. We move on to the next slide. The basic premise is all parents want to be the best they can be. And we know that there is this pressure that breastfeeding is absolutely the best thing you can ever offer your child and it will improve bonding it will be much better than bottle feeding in that respect um, and experts would say that actually bottle feeding your baby can have a negative impact on social and behavioral um, outcomes for children born to, to uh, women who bottle feed next slide please but actually if you look at the data and this is a starting point it's conflicting so when you look at women who are breastfeeding versus women who aren't, and you actually ask them about why they're breastfeeding, about rejection, anger, feelings of depression, feelings of anxiety, women who are breastfeeding are often feeling anxiety and depression more than women who don't breastfeed because they are exhausted. The onus is on them entirely to um, breastfeed, to feed that baby. Therefore, I think this is a starting point to actually consider. We need to step back and remember that there are different ways to do things and we need to share all of the data with women. Next slide, please. So I'm going to review breastfeeding and HIV over time. Next slide. So if we start in 1992, the next slide, we can see that there was a, yeah. I'm so sorry. Uh, of interrupting but we can hear another person very close to you so it's okay it's a bit, give me one second I think, you know concentrating is it possible to ask him to
1992, there was an additional risk of HIV uh, transmission reported uh, of about 14% in women who were breastfeeding in, in Nigeria. Then in 1999, it emerged that actually you could reduce the HIV transmission risk through exclusive breastfeeding. And that was through avoiding um, any use of formula, only breastfeeding, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, and uh, not mixing the two. And then in 2001, it was decided that formula feed was actually the, the best way that babies with HIV could be fed um, to avoid risk of transmission. Moving on then to the next slide. In 2005, bottle feeding was recommended globally as the preferred option for women with HIV to feed their babies. Um, and uh, this was adopted globally until there was some data presented at Croy in 2007, which showed very clearly what was working in some parts of the world may be effective, but actually where globally formula feed was not available. There was Deke et al. did a presentation at Croy showing babies born to women living with HIV had a higher risk of dying of malnutrition. The WHO revised their advice to recommend breastfeeding following this excess morbidity and mortality um, uh, where babies were were being advised to formula feed. And this, this was because if you looked at feeding centers, there simply was not the formula feed uh, amount required to feed babies properly. Next slide, please. So in 2010 in the UK, I'm gonna look firstly at Europe and then move to the global picture. There was a beaver statement on women breastfeeding when the viral load was undetectable. So prior to this statement, women with HIV were not allowed that was the exact wording to breastfeed their baby. And should they choose to breastfeed their babies, they would be um, reported to social services and there would be a risk that the baby would be taken into care. In 2010, we decided that actually the data was safe enough to show that when a viral load is undetectable, the risk of transmitting uh, through breast milk was incredibly low. And therefore, women who were undetectable on treatment could be supported to breastfeed without take, needing to take anything further. Where women were breastfeeding with a detectable viral load or off treatment, that remained still uh, a position where we would need to involve childcare services. Next slide, please. And so this amendment was published. Um, this is still available online as a statement on the Viva, Viva website. Next slide, please. Um, and what was this based on? So what we were doing was looking at the data from low and middle income countries. So that's LMIC for the duration of the presentation. So this was the New England Journal medication publication of the Mabana study, which looked at giving women antiretroviral regimens in pregnancy and to cover the breastfeeding period in Botswana. And what they found was a, a risk of transmission to HIV in women who were breastfeeding on antiretroviral therapy of 1.1%. Next slide, please. This study is then the Keisha Bora study. Um, this is published a year later. So this is 2011, looking again at triple therapy combined uh, compared with Lidovudine versus infant novarapine prophylaxis during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Uh, to prevent um, HIV acquisition in the baby. And in this study, the risk of transmission again was far lower where antivirals were given to women who were breastfeeding. It was lower in the nevirapine group as well at 48 weeks compared to the control, which was zidovudine and not even zidovudine necessarily covering the breastfeeding period. So this risk was about 3.5%. Next slide, please. And then finally, this is the BAN study, which again looked at um, maternal and infant antiretroviral regimens, so very similar to the previous study we've just seen, uh, again showing uh, a reduced risk in both of the groups where either the woman or the baby received antiretroviral therapy, uh, uh, allowing breastfeeding for quite a significant period of time um, and ultimately much better than control. So based on all of this data, um, Beaver, so certainly the Mabana study was one of the, the, the first studies that had big numbers. Prior to that, there was the Amata study. But based on the 2010 date, uh, the, the data that we had in 2010, we issued that statement. And then next slide, please, based on the further two other published studies, we added it to our guidelines, um, but we advised breastfeeding exclusively for a maximum of six months because all of those studies showed if you breastfed for longer than six months, the risk 
doubled, even though the figures remained low, it was higher. And therefore, six months, we felt, was the safest we could advise based um, on evidence that we had. Next slide, please. So in 2016, moving on from that, that's four years later, the majority of guidelines from high income countries were still not supportive of breastfeeding. Next slide, please. And in fact, um, why was this? So the thought was, well, we have data from lower middle income countries. And actually, the likelihood is they were probably going to overestimate the transmission risk in high income settings, if anything. Because if you look at those trials, they included women starting ART at any time up to and including third trimester. So starting far later, certainly than we would recommend in the UK, which is usually 20 to 24 weeks and discontinuing at six months postpartum. If we also think about the regimens that were being used at the time, they were NNRTIs and PIs which are far likely, less likely to suppress as quickly as a lot of the um, INSTI regimens that we're currently using. And also, um, women often discontinue treatment as soon as they had delivered in some of those countries, because at that time, it was common practice up until 2015 to be on treatment um, only for the duration of your pregnancy if your CD4 count was high, just to prevent uh, vertical transmission and then to stop at the end of pregnancy. So it was a very, very different setting, which is why things didn't move the way they should have moved um, uh, throughout Europe. Next slide, please. So EACS went even further to say they updated their guidelines to allow breastfeeding if a woman insists, but the choice of language is very blaming. It's stigmatizing, it's, in, it's suggesting lack of care, poor choice of language, but luckily it has been revised. Next slide, please. So if we think about the recommendations that everybody in high income countries was making, given the data that we had to show actually the harm was probably far less than we thought, why were people interpreting data differently? And it was really about balancing benefit versus harm if you had the ability to provide formula feed to your to your um, pregnant uh, people living with HIV. And I think it was all taken that in low income settings that potentially formula feeding was also more risky because of potentially unclean water. But um, uh, and also there was lost protection because there was no breastfeeding or paternal antibodies to fight infection and then lack of availability of formula feed. So all of these things made people think, well, what's happening in low and middle income countries um, is different probably to high income countries, but high income countries were never going to do trials in the same way because we had ART and because we had formula feed. So global inequity of access for women to treatment and for their children as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. Grant. So luckily, Things have started to move on. So in 2018, the American guidelines, DHHS, advised that we could give evidence-based information to uh, people who are pregnant and support choice to breastfeed. And our BEVA guidelines continue to support and actually give practical advice on how to support women. So using peer mentoring, using an MDT, so a multidisciplinary team. Next slide, please. EACS in 2021 revised their language, which is very positive. They still, however, advised against breastfeeding because the optimal way to prevent transmission was using formula milk. Next slide, please. And in 2023, no guideline in any country in Europe or, or in the high income countries recommends breastfeeding first line. Next slide, please. EACS just released their guidelines last week, so hot off the press from Thursday. Breastfeeding is not recommended routinely. So again, they've moved forward with their language and have advised in situations where there are persistently undetectable maternal HIV viral load and a very low risk of transmission, breastfeeding may be facilitated by joint decision making and with close monitoring. So the monitoring, though, however, we still advise in the UK, but that can be a stumbling block. And we can talk about that in the discussion with Aneta, 
because getting a mum and a baby uh, or a parent and a baby into clinic every month can be very, very tricky. But this is still where the high income country guidelines are. Next slide, please. What about in the US? So I talked about the 2018 guidelines. So again, uh, last year at Croy, there was a big launch about the recommendations for use of treatment in breastfeeding to avoid transmission to babies. Um, but actually, the reality is there is no consensus there to the point where clinicians, they have a 24-hour hotline, clinicians can call to advise what the infant receives. So there still is a lack of consensus in that, whereas in the UK and in European guidelines, we recommend standard antenatal postnatal prophylaxis for babies with or without breastfeeding. In the US, they haven't come down on the side of you can still use standard prophylaxis for babies yet. So it's individualized, which might sound great, uh, you know, in helping every single person in a different way. But actually, it also can create a little bit of confusion. So I think for us in the UK, having a standard way, um, probably this is one situation where individualization of care may not necessarily be beneficial because it can create confusion about the advice and the conversation you have um, before the baby is born. Next slide, please. WHO, there are streets ahead of us. So in 2015, they'd already moved on in 2018 with the DEEKS data for um, breastfeeding. 2015, absolutely, they've updated this and they've talked about how the risk of um, uh, HIV acquisition uh, for a baby during breastfeeding is incredibly low at, tw at 12 months and 24 months. And they also talk about um, the, the uh, strength of the evidence actually being quite strong. Next slide, please. And then in 2023, they issued a global um, statement on the role of HIV viral suppression in improving individual health and reducing transmission. So they included U equals U and gave their statements about viral loads for people on treatment, less than a thousand, et cetera, um, and sexual transmission, but also talked once again about breastfeeding and talked about the risk of transmission being very low, less than 1%. Again, the mum is taking treatment or the parent is taking treatment throughout the breastfeeding period. Um, and I think this is really important that actually myself and Annette have realized that we can learn from other countries where we feel maybe their healthcare structure is not as positive or as struct, you know, as, as well developed as ours. Actually, they've been doing things that we are starting to do for years and they are far more confident about women breastfeeding on treatment than we are. But we're really moving to change that in Europe. Next slide, please. So we know about U equals U from 2008 from the HPTN052 study, and then in 2017 from the partner study. Next slide, please. But we know this, we don't have data yet to say that this is applicable in the context of breastfeeding. Next slide, please. So the infant, the data that we currently have, we have more data since the other studies I spoke about. So we have the BISPO et al, and we have the PROMISE study. PROMISE is probably the one that's most quoted. So the risk of HIV transmission would be about 0.3% at six months where women are breastfeeding on treatment and 0.6% at 12 months. And this is because, again, this is a doubling, even though it's small numbers, it still is at the point where we would say six months maximum and then no more. Next slide, please. The other thing we also need to think about is mixed feeding. So exclusive breastfeeding versus mixed has historically put women off supplementing with formula milk. Um, whereas actually the reality is you want to avoid, avoid breastfeeding if you have advanced HIV or if you have mastitis or if the baby's unwell. But in those situations, it could be that formula milk could be used safely because actually when you look at the figures, Exclusive breastfeeding risk of transmission is nine per 100 child years. Predominantly breast milk with a liquid is 9.5. So the problem is introducing solids and introducing solids too early. So it's 41.2 per 100. So the whole idea of mixed feeding is solids with breast milk, not breast milk with formula feed if it is needing needed. And sometimes it is to establish breastfeeding um, in the first place, because we know that that can be a very, very tricky path for all people who want to breastfeed. Next, next slide, please. 
what's happening in the UK. We've been supporting breastfeeding, as I said, since 2010, and we've been collecting data. The slide here shows figures of 151 women who have breastfed babies or infants who have been breastfed in the UK. It's, we're now up to 267. I've just heard that. And actually, what we haven't seen is a single baby who has been positive in this group. So these are women who are suppressed on treatment before they deliver. They continue to breastfeed and they have additional monitoring. Next slide, please. So if you look at the UK figures and why they are doing this, it is bonding. It still is one of those things that comes up again and again. But they're also talking about health benefits, family pressure, all of these different reasons that those of us who work in HIV are very, very familiar with. Next slide, please but we are not seeing more infants born with HIV in the UK. So that's what we need to think about is we are, women are breastfeeding. We've seen no change in figures. Next slide, please. So briefly, just to finish, uh, I authored a Beaver infant feeding update in December, 2022, which talked about mixing breast and formula and how that was okay and how that could be used to supplement and establish breastfeeding. Next slide, please. Um, we also produced information sheets for um, parents living with HIV because communication is absolutely key. People need to know what's safe and what isn't, and having something they can refer to at home is important. Next slide, please. Um, and we have a Safer Triangle um, uh, information leaflet, which is available on the British HIV Association website, which can be downloaded you know, fitted with your hospital logo, your clinic logo, which you can share, you can translate, which you can share with women. Next slide, please. And birthing parents. So in summary, decisions about breast and chest feeding are complex. They are emotional, but also we need to be evidence-based. And we are getting more evidence, which is qualitative, which Annette will talk more about, quantitative, but there still are many unanswered questions. And we cannot say 100% that U equals U applies in breastfeeding. The difficulty is guidelines and recommendations are consistent, but really the key thing is a discussion with an individual about what information is available and then to make um, a decision about whether breastfeeding and chest feeding will happen. But don't forget about peer mentors, really, really key in the UK. We're very lucky to have them. And if you do have them in your clinic, please use them. I'm going to finish there and hand over to Annetta. Sorry Thank for all the hiccups. No problem at all. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Uh, so interesting listening to you and getting this background and I hope we will have the opportunity to get back to some of the slides and talk some more about them during the discussion. Uh, but before that we're going to, to uh, listen to our next lecturer Annette Harbel who is joining us from Frankfurt in Germany. Annette is a medical doctor and researcher specialized in HIV medicine since 1998. She runs the unit for women living with HIV at the HIV Center of the University Hospital in Frankfurt. She is also vice chair of WAVE, as well as the supervisor of working committee on breastfeeding within the network. And she is also co-chair of the German Austrian Pregnancy Guidelines Panel. And now she's joining us from Frankfurt. Please, Annette. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's really an honor to be with you today. And, and the next question is very simple. Can you see my slides now? We can. Thank you. You, we, you can. Okay. Yes. So, so I will just um, yeah, continue <laughs> where Yvonne stopped her presentation. It's on the management of breastfeeding with HIV across Europe. And first, yeah, I'd like to add some information on our German-Austrian pregnancy guidelines. So uh, we do it um, like question and answer in the guideline text. And the question exactly is, should mothers living with HIV breastfeed their babies? And the answer is, in case of suppressed maternal viral load, suppression is defined below 50 copies. Um, we aim for a shared decision on breastfeeding. So it's, it's pretty much the same like the Swiss recommendations. Um, and we are also clear in case of maternal viral load above 50 copies, we recommend against breastfeeding. And then what about the monitoring of breastfeeding mothers and their infants? So in Germany and in Austria, we recommend maternal viral load um, every four weeks. For the infants, 
it's a little bit different. So we check the viral load at week two and four after birth and then every two months during the breastfeeding period. And also, which is um, important, two and six weeks after um, weaning um, cessation of breastfeeding. And what about introduction of solid food? Something Yvonne uh, talked about already at uh, the earliest at the age of four months. So four to six months as usual. Okay, so that was the German Austrian guideline. Um, and, um, and then I, I want to present the, the key results from Ensure HIV and Breastfeeding in Europe. That was a survey um, conducted by WAVE. Um, as Yvonne said, um, uh, WAVE is um, a working group of the European Aid Society, and we wanted to look at guidelines and practice of breastfeeding in women with HIV across Europe. And um, I'd like to thank Amy Keane. She did the analysis of the results of the survey, and she already submitted the manuscript for publication, and right now it's under review. And so I am allowed to use her slide. I'm very thankful for that. So how did we do this survey? We established, established a steering group and then a survey was created consisting of 38 questions. Not all were um, mandatory, you did not have to answer all of them. So, and it was distributed to 31 countries across Europe and we identified respondents of each country and most of these respondents were also um, deeply involved in the field of um, pregnancy guidelines and, and um, really uh, knew what they were talking about. We used JotForm and the survey was sent to the respondents end of March last year and the survey was closed mid of March. So um, first let's start about um, with the trends of bre in breastfeeding. So it was divided fairly half and half. So um, half of the respondents said the number of breastfeeding uh, women living with HIV in the country is increasing. Um, 48% said it's stable and one respondent said it has been de decreasing lately. So, but we have to be careful with the numbers, we all have very low numbers. So here is the estimated number of women living with HIV giving birth per year. And you see most of the countries have uh, less than 100 women per year giving birth. And then there are some 100 to 500 women. You can see also Germany here in this group. And then there are only a few countries with more than 500 women um, living with HIV giving birth per year. And you can see Russia, Ukraine, but also France and UK. Now let's look at the number of breastfeeding cases. And, and here it becomes clear, we look at very, very low numbers. Most of the countries report less than five breastfeeding women um, um, during the last year. And um, there are some um, that, um, that have five to 50 breastfeeding uh, cases. And here you can also find again, UK and Germany. And also Switzerland appears two times as I can see right now, so. Now, what about HIV and pregnancy guidelines? Um, 25 responses were included in the analysis and 23 of um, these countries have guidelines on HIV and pregnancy. And if they have guidelines on HIV and pregnancy, they also refer to breastfeeding. And 12 out of the 23 countries recommend still against breastfeeding and 11 offer an option to breastfeed if certain criteria are met. And like Yvonne said, no country offers an option to all women living with HIV to breastfeed the infants. And here in this table, you can see the different countries and you can see if they have guidelines um, on um, HIV and pregnancy and if the guidelines refer to breastfeeding. And then you can see in AMBER, breastfeeding is offered or there are breastfeeding options if a certain criteria are met and red is recommendation against breastfeeding. 
Now we move on. What are the criteria for breastfeeding? So we got responses from 17 countries and all of them said uh, the, the, the most important criterion is um, a maternal viral load fully suppressed at the time of delivery and seven countries defined are the cutoff with 50 below 50 copies. And also um, some countries require a certain time, a minimum period of time with the suppressed uh, viral load in pregnancy. And you can see here, it varies from four to six weeks to um, suppressed viral load prior to conception. So what about the viral load monitoring during breastfeeding? So, um, 55% of the respondents have a recommendation for the frequency of maternal viral load monitoring during breastfeeding. And all of them say it's every four weeks. So a very close monitoring. And 59 respondents have a recommendation for the frequency of infant viral load monitoring. And that varies between the countries. And Surprisingly, only 55% have a recommendation for infant viral load monitoring after complete cessation of breastfeeding because um, that, um, that checkup will tell us if um, a transmission occurred during the breastfeeding period or not. And it's, it's absolutely crucial to do that. But you can see um, there is a lack of recommendation on that in 45% um, of, of the countries where we got res um, a response from. So recommendation around the type of breastfeeding, 10 respondents reported exclusive breastfeeding is recommended if a woman chooses to breastfeed and the majority advised exclusive breastfeeding up to six months of age. And 55% of the respondents have a recommendation for the minimum age of introduction of solids that was um, four, four months in, in two times and one respondent said two months, which is quite early, and one respondent said nine to 12 months of infant's age. So are there also recommendations on the duration of breastfeeding? We heard from Yvonne six months um, is something we could consider due to the data we got, we've got from the PROMISE study. 42% um, of the respondents have a recommendation on duration of breastfeeding and um, it's defined as short as possible, four to five months, six months, and not longer than six months. So what about research on breastfeeding? Um, a third um, of res the respondents um, have an ongoing research or studies on breastfeeding in women living with HIV. And there's also one breast milk biobank. And almost all countries or all of the respondents are interested um, to collaborate around breastfeeding in women living with HIV. So coordinated, for example, by, by WAVE, and they want to join a network for research. So in conclusion, to sum up the results of the survey, there there is a discrepancy in guidelines on breastfeeding for women living with HIV in Europe. It really varies looking at the same data as Yvonne said, but drawing different conclusions and giving different recommendations. The number of um, breastfeeding women is increasing, but on a very low level, just remember the data I showed you. And there are studies ongoing at national and regional level. Um, and there is a strong interest in collaboration uh, to improve our knowledge on HIV and breastfeeding. As we all have only single cases, we need um, to, to um, join the data and look at it um, on a European level or even on an international level. The majority of respondents want to join a network to start a conversation around breastfeeding and to support one, one another um, and also women living with HIV who wish to breastfeed. And um, um, that is a good um, opportunity for me to invite all of you to join the next wave breastfeeding Jewel fix. Um, that is on 15th November, starting at 7 p.m. 
send for your pin time and you can already register. It's on LinkedIn and you can use the QR code and we'll have the pleasure on, on, on the next um, meeting to fix that Natasha Davis from uh, South Africa will join us and she will um, introduce the new international network in Form Plus. Like I once said, we can learn a lot from countries who have higher number, which have higher numbers and a lot more experience in managing breastfeeding um, than we do. And um, yeah, so this is um, an invitation and I want to end with some uh, voices of breastfeeding mothers that's taken from the sister study we conducted in Germany um, to get um, to get a feeling of um, of the perception of breastfeeding the experiences of women living with HIV made um, during the breastfeeding um, period and you can read by yourself and I think um, yeah we already mentioned it's also a very emotional issue and um, yeah so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions, comments, whatever. That's uh, extremely interesting uh, listening to you and to this uh, contribution. Uh, we will see, do we have, we don't have any questions yet. Uh, please, if you have questions for Yvonne and Annette, you can just uh, um, send a text message or uh, give them on the chat. Uh, listening to both of you, it's very obvious that uh, th this field is very complex, uh, both uh, on, on a global level and between European countries. Um, and regarding the, the guidelines, uh, both on a European and, and global level, what do you see uh, for the future? Do you think there will be any significant changes in the guidelines? It's interesting what you said here, Annette, that there is a big interest um, in the European countries for a further collaboration in this field and to share experiences. Well, it's pretty clear. As I say, we all look at, at quite few numbers. I mean, UK, you have quite a high number, relative high number of breastfeeding cases. Even in Germany, we look at more than 50 cases per year, but still these are very low numbers. So, and we are all feeling kind of lonesome with our mm. single breastfeeding cases. And sometimes we even, I admit, feel somehow uncomfortable. You know, it's not you equals you in terms of breastfeeding. So there will be this one transmission maybe happening someday. And we want to make sure to really um, to really deliver the, the, the highest quality and safety. I don't know how to say it in, in English. Yvonne, can you help me? So, so, so the really safety first but also respecting what women want so which is not in contrast but we it's it's a work in progress we are not mm. done yet and so we are making experiences we are collecting data and and we really have to make sure we look at we we have to to join and collect our data together and look at it together and then uh, revise our guidelines um yeah to to um to be to be as updated as possible. Hmm. And as a comment uh, to Annette here, you say it's it, it, to what pe what the women want themselves. Um, uh, how well do the 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 countries listen to uh, to the women and what their experiences? Well, <laughs> I can't tell. I can I can only tell from my own country yes. and yeah we we are listening but we have not listened we have not been listening carefully enough because when we did a retrospective analysis um we saw that there have been a uh, quite a few breastfeeding cases we didn't even know about so women had been breastfeeding in secret they did not tell us because they knew that we would recommend against it so mm. i think we have to be very open and mm. and listen to the women even if, if they want to do something we would not support like for example breastfeeding with a with a detectable viral load we recommend strongly recommend against it but i want to know mm -hmm. it so at least i can do something to improve the situation mm. so yeah or it's 
like if one said it's all about language listening is one thing but giving a command is the other thing and and we have to be careful how we say things and how we um how we recommend um uh, um in a certain scenario mm, thank you and yvonne you had an example when they wrote that if women insist mm. an example of this kind of uh uh, poor, poor language. Uh, do you? What do you say about the openness in in listening or trying to listen or get the experiences from from the women themselves? I think it's incredibly important. We have two women living with HIV on the pregnancy guidelines group in in, in Viva, the British HIV Association, at any one time, and not just one person because one person may not feel able to say something. Whereas if there's another person with HIV in the room. They may feel more empowered, so that's hugely important. And in 2018 guidelines, I changed the language entirely because we had been talking about mother-to-child transmission. We had been talking, I think we didn't mean to, but I think the language as a whole for all of us wasn't as nice, as kind, as respectful as it could have been. Um, and actually changing that was hugely important. Um, and I think also what we do, we have the pacify group where we have asked women with HIV if they want to breastfeed and if they did, why they did, and if they didn't, why they didn't, or why they would choose not to. And also we have the Nourish UK study, which is run by uh, a researcher who is a woman living with HIV, interviewing healthcare professionals, but also women and birthing parents so that uh, she can ask. And actually, I think that's brilliant because if you're a woman living with HIV and you're being asked by another woman li living with HIV about breastfeeding, I think you're probably more likely to open up. So I think that's been hugely beneficial. I think I just wanted to also bring up parallels with what's happened before. U equals U, the Swiss issued a statement in 2008 about U equals U and none of us believed us because we didn't have the trials to show that it was correct. And 2015 was when we didn't have the trials in the UK, we did have studies from developing countries, HBTM, but we didn't from, from high income countries. So it took us until 2015 to work out that actually that was entirely correct. And I think as well, if we look at normal delivery versus cesarean section, again, the data lags hugely behind what was actually happening. So with normal delivery, we thought that wasn't as safe initially, but where you're on treatment, it is as safe as a section. And in fact, you avoid complications of infection, bleeding, not being able to pick the baby up. But again, women were just doing it because babies needed to come out when they were coming out and that was it. And ultimately, when we collected the data, we could see that it was safe. So I, I suspect we're in that um, time where the data will eventually catch up with what is happening, what is safe. But we are a group who need convincing. We are evidence based. And I think working globally with inform will help us in Europe to understand where we don't have the experience, the confidence to support breastfeeding, actually, we will learn that from somebody else. But the important thing is actually that we're reaching out and we're doing that. Mm. Um, and I think that's very important. And I think for Sweden as well, um, for any country, it's crucial to see what other people are doing, even if you don't feel you have the confidence or the legal or uh, medical structure to support that, but actually to look outwards rather than inwards. Mm. And I, I think that's hopefully where we are now. We're looking outwards and we can learn if mm. we're not going to be able to do the studies here. Mm. Learn from other countries. We have a question here, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yeah. Hello. My, Hello. I, I don't think whether or not you can see me, but it doesn't matter. My name is Karin Pettersson. I'm a Swedish obstetrician and I'm responsible for... Uh, the national guidelines together with a lot of colleagues concerning HIV and pregnancy and breastfeeding. And I think look, hearing you both and if anyone was really interested, interesting. I have one question. When you meet a woman who wants to breastfeed uh, and she is well treated with viral load lower than 50 copies, do you add R R T A R T to the baby? No. No. You no. just follow the baby with HIV RNA. Yeah, so we give the same, so we give, 
the same, certainly in the UK, we give the same post-exposure prophylaxis yeah. that we would give the baby if the mum wasn't breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So we would still give, for a woman who's undetectable on treatment long-term, it's likely to be two weeks of treatment. That's what we recommend, two weeks of PEP for the baby. There's no evidence to support extending it. And I think that's where we, myself and Annette, differ with the, the US guidelines in that they're not clear on whether or not you extend, whereas we would say evidence suggests you don't need to. Yeah, maybe maybe I, I, I may add that in the survey, we also asked for the post-exposure prophylaxis. And, and again, that varied, uh, that varies across Europe. So some people really give extended post-exposure prophylaxis to the baby or like the SWIT, they don't give post-exposure prophylaxis at all if the baby is at a low risk which we would suppose when we recommend breastfeeding. So they don't give anything, but it varies. Some, uh, some countries give post-exposure prophylaxis through, through the breastfeeding period. So here again, you can see it's not consistent um, looking at the same data, but um, giving different recommendations. And I think the US is doing really if I may say so, are uh, really worse because this individual base, that's nothing you can deal with. You need recommendations, at least on a national level. Mm -hmm. uh, people need that to, to look at and to act like it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corinne. And we have another question. Um, it's like this. How would you suggest health care workers that are positive to updating the Swedish guidelines about breastfeeding and HIV to bring up conversations regarding this topic to colleague, colleagues that might be against or negative to changes. It's a, it's a really tough one. It's um, a tough yeah. one. It's a tough one. I mean, I remember when I came to where I work now in 2005, they were still doing cesarean sections on all women with HIV. <laughs> Why are you doing this? There's no, absolutely no indication for it. And they were saying, well, there's no publication. And so it, it was only when I started to show them the data that I knew was emerging that I could convince them that this is something we needed to do. And I, I suspect evidence base is kind of a really good thing. But I think talking about cases where actually cases, women, birthing parents have breastfed and it's been fine. And whether that's from another country or another country's experiences, I think sharing evidence, opening the discussion, mm. asking for their concerns, um, but just trying to sit together as a group and work together on consensus. Because I think that's really the, the, the thing is, is drip, drip feeding the information. That's how I did it here until eventually somebody realized when they looked up the data themselves that actually we needed to move on and do something different. So certainly that's my experience of trying to bring another group on board. Mm. And that's a, how about yeah. you? It really takes time, and yeah. and still we uh, there's still a room for improvement. Um, if I can uh, say it this way, and in our sister study, we also asked the women, um, um, how did they feel, or what was what is what was um their perception um regarding the different involved disciplines. You know, caring for pregnant women, breastfeeding women is an interdisciplinary approach, and so um the the HIV doctor were rated uh, yeah it was kind of a rating was were rating best and then on the other hand some pediatricians um were not rated quite as good and some um other of the healthcare workers so you see it it also depends um in 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 what discipline you you go into it and 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 look at so i think the information on breastfeeding is not spread equally mm -hmm. and it takes time it it takes um it takes first own experiences and then you start in your own department then in your clinic and and you sit discuss and then you have one one woman breastfeeding you have the second one you get more feeling for it it takes really time mm -hmm. and as we as we always say it's a very emotional topic so mm -hmm. it's not only looking at the data which what we should do uh, always should do but it's also what i think would be good and mm -hmm. um 
and so we also had um, breast, uh, uh, women who intended to breastfeed and in the delivery room somebody said are you really going to do it now your baby is healthy are you really going to risk all of that and and putting your baby at risk and then the, 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 it is a very stressful and emotional situation and then the woman decided not to go for breastfeeding anymore. So we have seen lots of um, different situations, not all of them were really good ones. Um, mm. So we are moving forward, but as I say, still room for improvement. Mm, thank you so much. So Can time I... and having this conversation and sharing experiences and research. Uh, I have another question about co collaboration. Uh, could, there be, could there be an option for European countries to do a united research on HIV in breast milk? Often it's argumented that there aren't enough women for a study, but if we countries participating apply the same guidelines, follow-ups, then it should be possible to have a common database with information as if the study was being done in one country. And that's your probably best yeah. place for this because you're part of the wave <laughs> okay. breastfeeding group. Okay, in the breastfeeding group, uh, we are aiming to have kind of a, a pan-European breastfeeding registry. But to be honest, that is not easy to do, not only due to um, private policy data security reasons, it's also that most of the countries they don't know their own numbers yet. They might have estimates, but there are not really um, 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 registries like like in the UK. You have ISOs, but but and not so many countries collect um, their breastfeeding cases in a standardized way. So before we step on the European level, we have to make sure each country where women living with HIV breastfeed um, collect the data on these breastfeeding cases and then report it on, on up to the next level. And may I, um, maybe I, I can um, also comment on, on um, doing a research in breast milk. What should that research be on? I mean, we do viral load in breast milk in our clinic, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's not part of the recommendations and the guidelines. And I think we will step off because um, it doesn't give you any further information than other viral load in the plasma. When you look at the PK levels and the breast milk, there has been quite a, a bit of research on that topic. And to sum it up, around 10% of the maternal plasma levels can be found in, in the baby. So, it should be, as far as we know by now, uh, safe with no toxicity we see at the moment. And when you look at 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 cells, um, 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 cells. So where where can you find the virus? Um, the virologist told me not to go for that because you might find um, virus, but it's not clear if this is re replicable virus. If, if and and so it it's. It's, it doesn't offer more safety, it, it's, it's the opposite of it. So uh, we have to, to um, think about what kind of research makes sense and uh, how can we then come together on a European level or at least some countries um, can, can join or some centers. So we are just starting um, that uh, thing. And, um, and the next thing we are working on in WAVE, just to uh, say that one, once again, is to collect the data from different countries. So collect as much information as we can get. Thank you. Can I if just add there, like actually, because I have seen a movie, like a, a film that was made to be for patients, so it was a patient information film, talking about breastfeeding, and it talked about exactly what Annette just said, about the fact that we know that there is cell-associated HIV in breast milk, but we don't know if it's replication competent. We just don't know, and it varies in each breast, it varies from each feed, and actually in this film, they represented this by having breasts which were drawn with virus kind of flashing at you and I have to say that was quite frightening to see that this information was being given to women who just saw their breasts oh as flashing mm. with viruses and I did actually comment on the person who had made the film and advised that actually that is quite a negative image for a woman to see because all they can see is breasts full of milk which is full of virus and that's not a positive 
if you're trying to give an evidence base, it's negative. That's all women can see is the negativity of virus in their milk. So I, I agree. I think breast milk virus is not the answer to this. It will be clinical outcomes where breastfeeding is happening. Thank you so much, both of you. Time runs, runs fast and it's already 2.30 and we have to end this webinar. Thank you so much, Yvonne and Annette, for joining us today and sharing your research and view on this field. And we had some more questions, uh, and but maybe we can mail them yep. to you, yep, absolutely. Afterwards, of course. if that would be okay. Thank yeah, you yeah, so course, much. Yeah. And I also would like to thank, of course, everyone who has been participating in this webinar today. So take care, everyone, and have a nice continued day and week. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Really, Bye. Really Hope to see you again soon. Bye. 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 <laughs>